Welcome to the Alpha Girl Confidence Podcast, where we are empowering youth female athletes to play and live confidently. My name is Shay Hatto, and each week I will bring you new episodes to teach you the strategies and tools that you need in order to live a confident, empowered life both on and off the playing field. What's up, guys? Welcome back to the show. So today's episode, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Paige Lawrence, who is a former Olympic figure skater. Paige started figure skating at age nine and went on to compete in the 2014 Olympics in Sochi for Team Canada. Paige is now a performance coach for entrepreneurs and high achievers. She uses her athletic experience to help entrepreneurs ditch the excuses so they can take quick and impactful action towards their goals. I know I say this a lot, but this episode is genuinely one of the favorite interviews that I've ever done on the show. We dive deep into the lessons she learned as an Olympian, how to deal with judgment from coaches, from judges, from parents, how to build a solid team of coaches and mentors, and how to always focus on solutions instead of problems. I hope you're buckled up and ready to go because this episode is going to blow your socks off. Enjoy it. What's up, Paige? Welcome to the show. Excited to have you here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I think that you're the first Olympian that's ever been on. So I've had like a couple World Cup players, but you're the first Olympian. So I'm super excited and I'm sure my audience is stoked to have you as well. First, but likely not the last. Yes, that's my hope. First, but the last, not the last, not the last. Um, So like, I I am super intrigued to hear more about your story with the Olympics and we'll we'll really get into that. I'm sure my audience really wants to dive into that, but give us just kind of a a quick background to basically just who, who is Paige? Like, who are you? Who is Paige? Who is Paige? (laughs) <laughs> um, so I grew up in a small town in Saskatchewan, Canada. So teensy tiny town. My, my family has a ranch. Um, and I started skating, figure skating from a really young age and I just loved it. And so my parents were amazing and they just kind of continued to find ways for me to continue to grow and get better. And, um, long story short, I lucked into meeting up with this awesome coach who I started working with us with when I was nine. Um, and she was just a coach that was continuously finding ways to push me and to help me continue to grow. And when I was 15, I started skating pairs with a, a boy figure skater in my club. And we went on to compete internationally for Canada. We had a pretty awesome career together. We skated together nine years, which is a long time. Wow. Um, and we ended up competing in the Olympics in 2014, which was obviously the highlight of my entire career. Yeah. 2014. Was that Sochi? Correct. Yep. Awesome. That was Sochi. That's so yeah. cool. So figure skater. So it's so cool because like I, I actually work with a figure skater. She's, she's really young, but I work with a figure skater. And from what it seems like, it seems like it's like very, very like a lot of a big time commitment. Like you're training all the time. Was it like that for you kind of you know, even at a young age, it like takes up a lot of your time, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, like I said, I started skating with that coach when I was nine. Um, and I think then I was probably skating three days a week. But as I kept progressing, it was suddenly like five days a week, six days a week, but like long periods of times. I mean, I remember being at the rink from like after school, 3.30 until 9 p.m. type of thing. Oh. And I was a kiddo. And then uh, as we got older and I graduated, our, our schedule had more flexibility and freedom, which was right. great. Um, but it usually swapped to, to early mornings. But yeah, we uh, pretty much lived at the rink. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like tra- training that much is a lot for a kid, a teenager, whatever. Did you ever deal with any kind of like burnout or just like, uh, or like not loving it as much? Or were you always kind of, did you always love it? And did you always feel like it was, you know, meant for you, I guess? I, I always loved it. And I really thrived on being a hard worker because I would say that I was not the most naturally gifted mm. figure skater. I was a little bit like a bull in a china shop for a long, <laughs> long time. <laughs> and so all the results I achieved is because I decided to be the hardest worker, right? So I loved being first on the ice, last off the ice. That was like my big thing. Um, but I would say in my later years, I, I definitely experienced a season of burnout. Um, 
I think more through my own actions and, and lack of boundaries mm-hmm. than anybody else. Right. And says, so it's not that everyone pushed me into burnout is that I pushed myself into burnout. I was always that, that, that kind of like that hard worker kind of flipped the switch and it went too, too far the other way. But, um, through all of that, there was always that like grounding yeah. love for, for what I got to do. So yeah. I mean, boundaries, like let's talk boundaries for a minute. Like what, what kind of boundaries did you have to instill to, you know, be in the right headspace? I think one of the ones that I learned through all of this was really listening to my body, right? Because you have like the desire, you see the goal that you have ahead of you. And like I mentioned, like my answer was always, well, I'll just work harder to get there. And that really served me well. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It served me well for a long time. But it was at the expense of my own self, right? Like I was quick to sacrifice myself because I just knew that I could deal with whatever came my way. Um, and so a big boundary was really starting to respect and honor how I was feeling. Yeah. Um, instead of just like pushing through injuries, it was learning to be like, oh, I should actually work with this injury. Um, instead of just saying I could do more, I should really respect the fact that like, no, I need to kind of pause and I can work on different things. But, um, I'd say the biggest boundary was starting to pay attention and listen to the signals that my body was, uh, yeah. At me. I love that. And the thing with that is like, in my opinion, listening to your body will never lead you astray. Like yeah. it will never give you bad advice. Your body is all knowing in my opinion. Right. So I, I love that advice. Just listen to your body. Cause I, I know there's a, a lot of girls that I work with too, where they, they're, you know, feeling tired or they have some injuries and they're just like, no, I need to keep going. And I'm like, no, like recovery is important to like, listen to your body. So I love that you, you brought that up. Um, and, and I don't know if you had any issues or, or what your relationship with your parents look like, but there's a lot of parents that listen to this podcast as well. And I imagine that like, you know, your parents had to have been really supportive of you going through, you know, having this be such a big part of your life and probably your family's life as well. So kind of tell me just in general, like what was your relationship like with your, your parents in this? And also like, what was, you know, what, what did you like about their support or what would you maybe change or not, not change, but what, what yeah. wasn't great for you? So I, I have to give kudos to my parents. Cause I, I really think that they were, Amazing, obviously. Um, but I would say that one of the things that I'm actually most grateful for, I think, was they gave me this really strong foundation as an athlete. Um, growing up on a ranch, you know, like that that hardworking mentality was ingrained in me. The kind of like tough it out a little bit was ingrained in me. Like those were good foundational pieces that I then later on took and, and use a little bit too much. But one yeah. of the things I loved about what they did is that I remember when I started skating with this coach at nine years old, first off, they gave me the choice. They said, Hey, we know you love figure skating. We found this coach. Would you want to go? Right? Like we're fine. If you want to just stay recreational at our hometown, that's great. If that's what you want to do. Cool. If you want to get better, we'll take you here. And I remember jumping at the opportunity being like, yeah, I want to get better. Yes, I want to go train. But they didn't stop there. They said, great, we're happy to support you. But if you go there, it's going there to, to work, to get better, to show up on time and to put the effort in to, on the ice. We're not going there just to like socialize and play because you could do that at home with less commitment from us. Yeah. And so they kind of gave that like heads up, right? Like this is, this is the agreement. And then they held me accountable to that agreement, not in like a mean way. It was like a very conversational. So days would be driving home as a kiddo. They'd be like, well, do you think that you worked as hard as you could today? Do you think that you showed up and actually tried outside of your lesson? And, you know, my initial reaction as a kid was like, well, yeah. And then we had a conversation. And at the end of it, they helped me to realize like, well, no, I actually hadn't tried my best. And I actually don't feel great about letting my end of the deal down. I, I found on the days that I could answer, yeah, I worked my hardest. Mm -hmm. I valued hard work and I valued what I put into it. And that made me feel more confident about myself. Right. So they started to teach me the value of hard work, not just how to do it. They didn't just like push me for more, more, more. They really helped me to, to, to value it, to fall in love with it. And so I, I think that that's something that they did really well at a foundational age. Um, 
And then as I got older and older, they just continued to give me more and more freedom for my mm. own career. And they helped me to make my own decisions and then to live with the consequences of my own decisions. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for, for better or for worse sometimes. Um, but again, it, it helped me to show up as the athlete that was in charge of my own career rather than a kiddo that was just doing a sport. Does yeah. that make sense? I love that. I think that the biggest thing that I took of that, that I want to kind of echo is really that they gave you the freedom and autonomy to make your own decisions. Even at that young age, it was like, Hey, do you want to do this? Okay. If you want to do it, here's, here's the expectation, right? Here's what we expect of you. And they push you, but there was, there was, there was balance. Right. And then as you got older too, it's like, just again, going back to autonomy and freedom is, and, and letting them, letting you know, that you're doing this for you. You're not doing it for us. Don't ever do it for us. So that's the big thing that I got. And I think that's important because me growing up, there was most of my career, I did it for me, but there was in my teenage years, a time where I felt like I just did it for my parents. Uh And so I think that's a good distinction that they always gave you the autonomy. Like this is yours. This isn't ours. I think that's powerful. Yeah. Um, and again, they were just, they, I never felt pressured. I, I never felt like I was doing it for yeah. them. And they always helped me to see it was for me, even when I graduated high school and you're facing that, like, do I go to college or university, like all my friends, or do I pursue this dream of the Olympics, which is like, right. not a for sure. At that point in time, we were, I think just on the junior national team kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Like, there's a pretty big gap from junior national team to Olympics. Mm-hmm. And I remember really being torn. I, I knew I wanted to keep skating. Um, and they were like, listen, there's no wrong answer here, but you can always gain more education and you can gain education in different ways. You're only going to get one chance at a figure skating career. So if you have an inkling, we support you. It's okay that it's not the norm. It's okay that you'll be different than other people. That's okay. Mm-hmm. If it's what you want to do, let's go do it. Let's go all in. But again, you make the choice and then you stick to that choice. You honor that decision and you show up for that goal, right? Yeah. And and speaking of goals, this I was wanting to ask you this so it transitions perfectly, but I th- I think our society and you know us growing up and everything it's like all about the the external goal, the achievement, the outcome. And I am really in a space now where I am really trying myself to focus more on the process, like the journey, just loving it every second and being more unattached from the outcome. And I think that's, that's so hard to do. So I guess I want to go to, I guess your, your experience as a teenager, whether it's training for, you know, Olympics or whatever. Um, But what was your kind of mindset like around, achieving goals, but also, you know, really enjoying the process? Like, do you feel like you had a balance there? So I, I really like that question. Maybe I won't answer it wholly, but this is what it makes me think yeah. of. Um, is I know that pressure that can often come from like, I'm going to call, I call them outcome goals, right? Yeah. It's the result that you're striving towards. We all have them as athletes. We all have them as, as motivated, high achieving humans. Yeah. Um, And I had this experience as a teenager where I found that some of my goals were working against me, right? I I was getting disappointed and discouraged and losing self-confidence when I wasn't achieving them. Yeah. I had this awesome sports psychologist Mm -hmm. and we had this conversation about all of this and we ended up coming up with this like idea of setting performance goals. Mm -hmm. So taking the focus off of purely the outcome we wanted to achieve placing top three at nationals. Mm -hmm. And we said, what would that look like in terms of actions? What is 100% in your control page? That if you do all of those things, you really set the scene for you to get top three at nationals. And so we broke that down and it really brought us into the process. Because every day at training, I was showing up, not thinking about, I want to get top three at nationals, which feels really far away. was making me feel a lot of pressure and stress and and like lack of control, it helped me show up every day at training to be like, okay, if I know I want to land like my jumps. If I know I want level four, like blah, 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 that means today I'm training these five things really clearly. So it helped me break it down into really focused goals. 
And so that's what I do now, to be honest with you, as a, as a coach for entrepreneurs, is that we look at outcome goals and then we break them down into performance goals because performance goals give you that sense of control. They give you the ability to show up today in a way that's consistent with how you want to be in a year from now. It connects mm-hmm. the two really clearly. Um, and in the process of that, you have to learn how to enjoy the moment. Because if I'm miserable training right now, I guarantee you I'm not going to be doing right. any of the things I said I wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. And I, I love that because it's like when you set those performance goals, and I, I call them process goals, but I love performance yeah. goals. I love that. When you set those performance goals, it honestly, it doesn't even matter if you don't reach your outcome because you've at least, I, I'm sure you've gotten better. I'm sure you've learned things along the way. You've built discipline. You've created habits. Like the outcome at that point doesn't even matter. Also, if you actually hit those performance goals and you commit to those, you may get a better outcome than you even expected if you are really focused in on that. So I love that you broke that down and really kind of, you know, with your experience, how powerful that is, not only just with your sports experience, but with the coaches that you coach and in your own business and stuff, that's, that's amazing. So I want to make sure that everyone gets that. Well, yeah. And I think that there's just such awesome kind of like benefits that come with it because like for one, as athletes, I think we can all think back to a time when we did our best, like when you have finished your performance, your game, whatever, And you're like, man, that was the best I could have done. And then you look at the results and maybe you didn't win. Maybe you lost the game. Maybe you came fifth. You came last for crying out loud and we get defeated. And suddenly our best doesn't mean anything because we're just focused on the, the result. And that's devastating to me. Number one, right? You just missed out. You've just negated your best. And so Performance goals, I think, really give you that ability to stand tall and confident, shifting the perspective away from these things that are outside of your control and saying, no, I did my best. And that's actually what I came here to do. And I feel really hard or really good about it because I train really hard for that. And I I think it it gives you control of your own momentum, right? Because again, you leave that game and if you're feeling discouraged, it's a hard comeback to feel really good going into the next one. Whereas you can control the momentum you create because you can walk away from that loss and be like, no, I did my best. I'm going to do this and this to make it a little bit better. And next one, I'm going to roll into it. Cause I know that I'm, I know that I'm getting better. So you're also kind of setting the stage for the next thing. Right. So mm. I mean, I, I can talk about performance goals all day. I just love them. I think that there's so many. Yeah. benefits. <laughs> this is, I love this so much. Cause really when you look at it, right. Performance goals are in your control. Outcome goals are not necessarily. And so when you're only focused on the outcome, your confidence is is completely out of your control. Whereas when you focus on your performance goals and the process, you have complete control. The confidence is within you. So it doesn't matter if you lose. It doesn't matter if like whatever you don't get chosen for a team, like you would still be confident within you because that's where confidence comes from lasting inner confidence, right? Like if you win a game, you can be confident short term, but how long does that actually last? So I just, I love that part where you're talking about that you have control of, of your momentum. And when you focus on that, you have control of, of your confidence, your mindset, like your everything. So that's yeah. amazing. That's amazing. And so there was actually, um, uh, an IGTV that you did a while ago. And I think the title was something along the lines of like, wanting to become better doesn't mean that like you're not good enough or something like that. Right. So I, I was watching that and I, I just want you to kind of speak on, speak on that a little bit. Cause I think that's powerful. That's one of the favorite things that I, I think I learned through sport actually is um, I think often in time you hear people, th- this big thing about well, I'm, I'm not enough, right. Cause we're focused on what we're still trying to grow into. And so we see that the, the difference from where we're at and where we want to be, Yes. As, as if we have a deficit, as if we're not good enough. Whereas I truly believe that wanting to be better means that you've created this, this foundation, this layer that you feel really good about. You're like, I can do A, B, and C really good. I feel awesome. Like right here, right now, I'm a badass. Mm-hmm. And I really want to be better. 
I want to grow. I want to pursue these next goals. And so I'm going to own how awesome I feel. I'm going to own all my capabilities and I'm going to pursue that next level. They work really well together. (laughs) They kind of create that like unstoppable duo. I believe, I think that's what world champions have is, is you see them walking onto the field and, and they know that they're the best. They know they're a rock star. And yet every single day they show up to practice striving to be better, right? Looking for ways that they're not good enough to fix, to make better. They go together, right? Yeah, they do. And it really is. I'm just thinking about myself personally. And it's like, when, when I'm my most confident, that's when I also am like the most motivated to be better. Right. Whereas if I'm not confident, there's part of me that's like, ah, like, like there's something internally holding me back. So I, I love that. Like, just because you want more doesn't mean that you're not good enough. Like you, you mentioned like the, the deficit, right. Just because you want more doesn't mean that you're not good enough at where you're at now. Like where you're at now is exactly where you need to be. So be grateful for that, but also like want more for yourself. And I, I, I love that. I saw that IGTV and, and I think it was amazing. Thanks. And I I think it's one of the things that I would really like to invite more people to think about too, because if you think about comparison and competition, which with social media, we all have in our lives, right? But let's, let's, let's use those in this scenario. So you see somebody else who's rocking it and they're doing something. And your first thought is, oh my gosh, like she's way better than me. Right? Like why, why didn't I think of to do that? Okay. So that's you saying you recognize there's a, there's a difference between where you're at and where she's at. Instead of it making you feel terrible about yourself and like, you're not enough. Instead, what if you were like, man, I know I'm really good at what I'm doing right now. I'm covering all my bases. I know I'm making a change. I know I'm making a difference. I'm showing up at practice the best way, whatever, whatever your bases. And I clearly see, I want to be there. So I'm gonna make that a goal. Whatever she's doing right now, that's a goal that I want to have for myself in the next four months, whatever your timeline is. And shifting the script there to that's your better that you want to be. Great. Mm-hmm. Let's make it a goal. Let's work towards mm-hmm. it instead of just comparing ourselves to it and never doing anything about it. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing is that's, I would say, top two things that the girls that I work with struggle with is, is and I think everybody is comparison. And especially mm-hmm. the teenagers now, they have social media when we were teenagers we could only compare ourselves to the people that were around us. And so like, especially for, I would say, figure skating, gymnastics, like stuff like that, where you have judges and their scores and everything like that, I'm sure the comparison is even higher. So what, what was that like for you? Like, did you struggle with, you know, comparison and stuff when you were competing? Yeah, absolutely. I would say like, this is kind of like the the container that I learned this through is because you're right. You're you're in a judge sport. Everyone is judging everything that you do and how you look and how you act. You're being judged, right? So it's like second nature for you to then do that to yourself. And especially in a sport where you're getting like lifted above a guy's head and thrown across the ice, there's definitely a big pressure to be very thin, right? That's yes. something that. And I'm a small girl, but I'm also like a little bit thicker and muscular. And when you're competing internationally, that's not the norm, right? So that this is the big one that I dealt with. Um, And I would say that I definitely felt pressured to be looking like somebody else. Um, But again, I'm really thankful I had that strong support team because we focused on the aspects. We had conversations about what is it about this that you want? And what is it about this is just like expectations put on you from somebody else and questions like, okay, well, great. Do we want to make that a goal? If so, yes. And if not, great. We're going to let that go. Cause that's not for you. That's not for you to wear. So I think it started to reckon, it started to teach me that I got to make decisions about how I wanted to handle comparison. And it also helped me to build up that really strong inner sense of who I was. Because as I began to realize that there were some changes I didn't want to make and there were some strategies that were commonly used that I didn't want to do, it made me feel more secure in my own approach because I actively chose, hey, those are those things aren't for me or that's not a goal for me or I don't need to worry your expectations. Here's my goals. Does it fit? I also, by making those decisions, felt more and more secure about who I was. So I was creating that foundation of yeah. that confidence, right? 
it's hard. Don't get me wrong. It's hard. But I think that us talking about it and having teams of people to talk to about it um, can help kind of put that into more of an open light of a, like, rather than just comparing yourself to what other people are doing, actually thinking, is that something that I want to be doing? And if so, what does it look like for me to get there? Yeah. And if not, walk away from it. Yeah. There, there's seriously so much gold in this conversation. I'm like, wow, we could talk for hours, I think. Um, but one big thing that you said that I want to get a little bit deeper on is especially in, in your sport, gymnastics, like those kind of sports where you're, you're constantly being judged literally for everything you do. You say it's for things you don't do for the things you don't say, like it's all, it's a judgment sport. Right. And I think it's really hard when, when people judge, you know, let's say a teenager, when you're getting judged, if you don't know who you are, and if you aren't confident in who you are, you take all those judgments as truth. They think I'm not skinny enough. Therefore that's truth. They think that I need to cut my hair. Therefore that's truth. Like it's, it's just like, well, you, you sponge everything up and everyone's judgment becomes who you are. So I love that you said like you, you just knew who you were. And once you know who you are, you can choose to accept things and not accept things and like make goals out of different things. Like that's so powerful. Well, and I think, I think you're completely right. Like as, as young kids, as teenagers, we're sponges and we don't know who we are. Right? Right. So I think it is really important to have a very small team of people that you trust and that you can take those questions to. Like I had my coach, my parents, like my, my family, my brothers, um, and my sports psychologist. And I can remember, and my, my trainer. Yep. She was also awesome. And I can remember going to them with some of these, these, these labels or things that were thrown at me. Cause I, I was told, I was told the works. Right. And, and one time I'll give an example. Cause I think examples can be powerful. So I was actually similar to a weight that I am now healthy weight. Um, and I was told that I needed to lose weight to be like competitive on the international scene. Now I had, that feedback given to me by my coach said, this came from Skate Canada. Let's have a conversation about it. What do you think about it? And I was like, well, truthfully, like, I feel a little insecure about how big I am right now. I would like to be smaller. And she's like, great. I actually think that jumps would be easier for you if you were a little bit lighter and that, um, like, the things that you're doing would be easier. And I was like, great. So how do I do that? Because I don't want to go down that path of, of sickness. I've seen it. I don't right. want I don't want an eating disorder necessarily. Wow. And she goes, I don't want that either. So I can't help you. Let's bring in an expert. Let's look mm -hmm. around. Let's try to find somebody that can help you make some changes to how you're eating to get the desired result. Right. And so in that case, we had that really great conversation. I can remember exactly where we were, where it first started with, what do you think about that? Like an open-ended conversation. If I was like, I think I'm great the way I am, I bet you she would have been like, okay, cool. If that changes, let's talk about this again in the future. Um, but what happened was, is I ended up working with a great nutritionist. I cut weight and I found more confidence in myself and I stayed really healthy. And through that experience, I learned to trust my own decisions. I gained a little bit more of like that, that inner compass. Um, but I would never would have got that if I had just heard the feedback I need to lose weight. And just, and just dealt with it. Right. Like I, I talked to my coach, I went home. I talked to my parents. My mom was really nervous about me working with someone to lose weight. Yeah. Like we had conversations about these things, these ideas that were too big for me to sort through on my own. Yeah. And so that's why I think that having that really small team that you could talk to about anything is a really, really key component of a young athlete success. I love that because I've been working on some different like frameworks and stuff. And one of the things was you got to have a positive internal environment and you also have to have a positive external environment for like true success, confidence, that kind of thing. And you, you had that internal, it sounds like, but you also had that team, right? Because mm -hmm. if you have a strong internal, but you don't have a team, you don't have people to support you. And it's just judgment all the time. It can really wear, wear on you. Mm -hmm. And so I love, and you kept emphasizing the word, like a small team. And what I get from that is that you need a team or whether you call it a team or friends or family or mentors or whatever, but people that no matter what they 
want what's best for you as a human being, not just as an athlete. Like Mm -hmm. they will never lead you astray just to get the gold medal or just to, you know, have some external outcome. So I, I just want to emphasize like that, that team, that team, it's so important because I think a lot of the times people think I can do this alone and then they feel alone and that's no fun. Yep. And I think that's something that I came back to often because it's not like I lost weight once and like it went away for forever, right? Like it's right. never enough. Like, oh, maybe I maybe I should be skinnier. Maybe I should be smaller. And I always came back to like, great, let's talk about it with somebody, right? Or let's have a conversation if I'm feeling like I'm too big right now. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. What's making you feel that way? What do you want to change? Or do we need to change anything? Or should we maybe just start working on like how you perceive yourself? There's, there's always a, a way forwards, I would say, but like, if you're feeling the pressure and you don't know what to do with the, com- the comparison or you don't know how to flip the script to make yourself better, you see it feeling a deficit, I'd say reach out and, and talk to somebody, right? Yeah. Like what, what age did you start? Ha- like what age did a sports psychologist come on your team? Um, I think I'd started like looking for one, like kind of like introduced to, to one when I was, um, late teens like at seminars and workshops we started hearing from them and all that and then I worked with the lady for half a year and it was kind of like I didn't love it or see the value and then to be honest probably when I was 19 I was at a workshop and the sports psychologist was presenting there and I really liked his vibe and so I walked up to him and was like I've been searching for somebody I've tried with a couple different people and it just never fit would you be open to working with me? And it was amazing. I think it clicked, right? Like, I, I don't think it's a one size fits all. I do think it's, it's based off of a relationship and, and energy and how you connect. And he was amazing. He changed my life. He changed like my, my career. He is the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing now. Like he was just such a pivotal, pivotal person in my life. Right. But it, it wasn't just like an easy fix. It wasn't an easy find. It was trial and error. Well, yeah. And also, uh, like you said, it's not an easy fix. And I think there's a misconception when it comes to confidence and mindset that like, you know, you work on it for a couple months and it's like, okay, I'm good. Like, thanks, you know, peace. (laughs) Um, But like, talk about that, like, like just the importance of, well, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what's your thoughts on kind of the lifelong learning as far as, you know, mental performance and that kind of thing goes? Yeah. And like, you're you're like, oh, I found my confidence. I'm great. Um, (laughs) Confidence was something that I talked to my, like, I still have all my notes I have that I took when I was talking to them. They're super interesting to read. Confidence was something I talked about up until I competed. Like I had this, some crazy limiting beliefs or like self-fulfilling prophecies that I gave life to for a very long time in my career. Like I, I, don't let me stand here and say that I'm a confident being and I, I just got it. No, I work on it every day. I recognize my self thoughts. I look for patterns that aren't serving me. I'm consistently challenging myself every day so that I can feel confident because it's not a one-time thing for, for any of our own personal growth. It's not like you get it and then you move on with your life. It's continually re- refining and growing and evolving and And you do the work so that in those big moments in your life, you feel ready and prepared and confident, but the rest of the time, it's pretty messy. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know? (laughs) I love that. Yeah. Thanks for speaking to that. Cause I talk about it all the time. So it's nice (laughs) to hear from an Olympian and, and some, some other voice like, man, it's, it's really this something that you have to continue to cultivate it every single day or else, you know, it's just the growth stops, you know? Yeah. 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 Cool. So I, I want to, there's like, again, so much stuff that I want to keep like pulling <laughs> out, but I really want to get into kind of your, your Olympic journey. Like I know that there's so many girls that I work with that they want to, they want to go to the Olympics. They want to play for the national team. They, they have these huge dreams and goals. And so hearing it from someone that's been there, like, that's like, I'm, ex- I'm excited for them. I'm excited for myself to hear about it. So <laughs> So um, let's talk about like kind of leading up to the Olympics, like how far in advance did you train? Like, like kind of talk to us about the the pre Olympics, I guess. Okay. Yeah. So like I said, I started skating with my partner when I was 15 and we, 
it, it was like we, we kind of found the thing that we were good at, you know, like I, I, I was I was meant to be a pair skater, I believe. And so when we started skating, we knew we had a lot of talent um, and a lot of opportunity within the pair kind of community. But that 2010 Olympics kind of came around. Um, I would say 2008 kind of came around and we were like, ooh, right, right age. We're kind of like coming into the national team. We could go to the Olympics. It was like, kind of like, a, like we, could, we could do this, you know? And then 2010 Olympics rolled around and we were, I mean, actually we had a phenomenal like short program. We were sitting fourth and they sent two teams. Um, and then a terrible program. <laughs> we were not meant to go to the Olympics in 2010. Um, it was our first year as a senior. And, but it was that year that we were like, okay, no, our plan is not to go to the Olympics in 2010. Our plan is to go to the Olympics in 2014. That was kind of it. It was like yeah. probably like four and a half years out that we had our eyes on Sochi. Um, and then it was really just kind of like reverse engineering that goal. Like, what yeah. does that, what does that mean that in this, this, this quad, this next four years that we have to be doing, we have to be securing our international ranking. We have to be consistently one of the top three teams in Canada, like all of those types of things, kind of like laying the groundwork, um, politically. And then how do we say healthy and safe and grow our, our abilities so that, four years from now, we don't show up and have a great short and a bomb the long, right? Like how do we grow ourselves as individuals and athletes that we can compete in a way that, that gets us the results we're looking for. Yeah. What, what was the best experience that you had like in the Olympics in that period of time? Oh, I would say, I mean, there's so many, um, obviously like our programs, I, I think I'm really one of the when you talk to Olympians, it's either the Olympia Olympics for their like best performances or their worst, right? Because you either go and you do what you want to do or you miss an opportunity. I think it's a really polarizing question. <laughs> um, but for me, it was the best moment. Um, it wasn't perfect, but it was very surreal. I was in the moment. It was one of my best competitions personally. Um, and I mean, I'll, I'll never forget the feeling of being on the ice there. I mean, the first time I got off the ice and you forget, like the cameras are around and all that stuff, but my coach was there and I was like, oh, that was just so fun. You know, like that's broadcasted back to all my friends and family back home and everyone was like teasing me and like loving it. And then the last performance, I think I curtsied like, like I don't know, six times. I was like, I'm never leaving the ice. Thank you. You're like, ma'am, please, you. please leave the ice. Please leave the ice. Get the Canadian off the ice. Because <laughs> I was just in it. But then you then you have the opening ceremonies. I mean, that's a amazing experience. I quite literally was walking around with my like before yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, Paige, close your mouth. Like you <laughs> Close your mouth. <laughs> um, so that was pretty, pretty amazing. Um, the like friendships that you form, like being in this cheering section when Canadian women's like hockey team won the gold and they'd been down previously. And we were all kind of sitting there and collectively we were like, let's rally the girls. Like, let's give them their energy. And we just started like this crazy cheering section like energy was huge and after the game all the girls like came by and like slapped the windows it was like as a thing <laughs> they felt the energy like That's there's so those cool. kinds of moments that were just unchangeable um and I will say that maybe like an, an understated but so one of my favorite memories I'm just rattling them off now you guys <laughs> for, for an hour I've got a lot of stories <laughs> I would say that my first night in the Olympic Village kind of set the tone for me. That's why it's like a standout is because I'm not a shy person. I'm usually very like friendly. And like I said, I know who I am. So I feel comfortable talking to people. I'm fun. Um, and I found myself in the athletes lounge surrounded by these amazing athletes. And I had imposter syndrome. Mm, I was like, yeah. Who am I? Paige Lawrence from middle of nowhere, Kennedy, Saskatchewan what am I doing here? Like, who am I to be surrounded by these Olympians, right? Olympians is a term of people I saw on TV at the Olympics. It's not me. I'm not an Olympian. I just got here. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was sitting on the couch and I was like, okay, isn't how you want to show up, go talk to somebody. 
So I went and sat down with this group of people I didn't know, started playing cards, had this conversation with this guy next to me. He was from a small town. Like he, he was just nice and I felt relatable to him. I was like, oh, there's another person here that probably feels out of place. Like how fun that we're connecting. And yeah, like maybe, maybe you do belong page. And I had a great night and I went back to my room and I got on Facebook as we did back then. <laughs> <laughs> and there was like a BuzzFeed article that I had been tagged in and I'm scrolling oh. through it. And I saw the face of the guy that was next to me. And I was like, oh my gosh, I know him. <laughs> and it turns out he was a speed skater. He had won world titles. He medaled at the previous Olympics. And I was just like, <laughs> how did you not know you were talking to someone that's so like accomplished, like Paige, like, oh, <laughs> just kind of kicking myself. And the next day I see him walking down the, the road to the village and I was like, oh my gosh, why didn't you tell me you were so good last night? Like we were talking and I had no idea. And he looked at me and he's like, well, Paige, we're at the Olympics. We're all pretty good. Mm. And it sounds so simple, but it was a game changer for me. Like a light bulb went off and I was like, he's right. Like everyone here is just like me because we all came from some beginning. None of us were born Olympians. We all found something that we love doing and we worked our buns off and we got here. Like it was such a human moment for me. And then for the rest of the Olympics, I didn't care who you were. Yeah. I didn't care if you were Sidney Crosby. I was like, hi, my name is Paige. What's your name? And I met everybody on the Canadian team practically. And, and I just, I just know like people are, people were people, the rest of the Olympic games, maybe they weren't prestigious athletes. And so it was a really cool experience and something that I'll never forget because it's helped shape me for who I am now. Right. It puts it in perspective that accomplishments, success, it's not really the thing that makes you who you are. You, you're the human behind it. And, and for me, that would just change my whole entire Olympic experience. And so I felt like it was noteworthy, albeit maybe a bit winded. <laughs> my, my face hurts from like smiling. <laughs> That's such a cool story. I love it. And just like, like saying like, even, even Olympians, even the best in the world can have imposter syndrome, but then you just got to the point where it's like, you know, I, I do belong and I'm, I'm the same as, as all these other people. And so that's, that's such a cool story. And now I want to ask you, um, what was your, I guess we'll say is a challenge or your biggest learning experience from the Olympics? Ooh, biggest learning experience. Ah, oh, gosh, there's lots. I think part of it was almost, um, I would say I, I actually really found all of me at the Olympics. Being in a pair sport and being the, the like controlling person, like I said that I was and the, the self, not sabotage, but the like self-sacrificing person that I was, I was always very concerned about my partner's well-being and and what would help him to compete at his best? Because we needed both of us, right? Um, and we were very different, my partner and I. And we butted heads a lot. And I spent a lot of my career really being so consumed about what he needed and how I needed to act to help get there that I never showed up in my in my is my full light, I should say, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's a story for another day. <laughs> At the Olympics, it was kind of like, this is the moment you worked for, Paige, right? Like, be all of you. Like, show up as you. Don't dim your light. Like, love this experience. Live this experience. And I had my two best performances of my career, right? Like, I, I owned the moment. I owned um, everything that I had to do. I owned me. And I gave up a little bit of that control. Of yeah. him. Right. And, and it was for the best. Right. And so I think the thing I took away from that I learned through the Olympics and that I took away from it is it's like, be all of me as I move forwards in life. Right. Because that is what's going to help me to show up as, 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 and create the best results in my life. Um, so it's a bit of a, a like a, a messy lesson, I guess. And there's obviously layers mm -hmm. behind it. But I think that 
that's that's sometimes we're trying to control all the variables and we yeah. forget about the controllable variables just within ourselves. Like just narrow the field of focus here. And what do I need to be my best? <laughs> sometimes that's the only thing that you need to focus on. Yeah. I love that. You just said like, be, be all of me, right? Like, Oh, uh, like we could, well, we're going to end the interview soon. Cause I, <laughs> I want to be aware of your, your time, but I just, I just love that. So with that being said, last question, which maybe this last piece of advice you've already hit on, but like, what is one piece of advice you would give to a young athlete who wants to go to the Olympics one day? It's such a, it's such a hard question because there's like, I want to shout a million. So many. (laughs) Um, But I think one that, that wraps up a lot is be a solution finder because I think in any journey, there's going to be a million exit signs, opportunities to leave or to get distracted or to let somebody else, like we said, dim you or put you in a box or tell you you're not good enough or tell you you're never going to make it or cut you from a team. Like there's that's every successful athlete's journey is of all the no's, all the opportunities that they shouldn't have made it. And yet we do because we always find that solution. You always look for the, where can I be better? You always say like, what do I want to do to make me grow further? Um, you find a solution for every problem you come up against to get you to the goal that you really, really want. And so I think that, I think that's it. Be a solution finder yeah. for yourself. I mean, yeah. And like a lot of your stories and examples, it was like, you know, there was an issue or a problem or a challenge and you always had a solution or a goal to like combat that. And you came out of it stronger. So I love that. I think it's kind of like all encompassing to our conversation and, I like, I, like I said, I feel like we could go hours, so I might have to invite you back on the show within the next little bit. Um, but, but share kind of where my audience can find you, like what social media, like where can they learn more about you and just, you know, like soak up all of your goodness. Yeah. So you can go and follow me on Instagram at page Lawrence coaching. That's, that's probably the best place. And again, I, I think it offers an interesting kind of, um, perspective, I work with entrepreneurs. I work with like small business owners, but I'm speaking to them as an athlete. And so I have a lot of athletes follow and relate to the stuff because I think that it's, it's, it's in your language, right? It's meant to help people find their inner edge and become their best. And so come follow, introduce yourself, give me a hello in the, in the DMs. Like I'd love to meet some of the listeners to this podcast. Yeah. And saying that too, to back that up, like, especially let's say any college athletes or, you know, older, older athletes that are listening, like go follow Paige. Cause like she ties the athletics into it beautifully, but it's really just like, in my opinion, to put it very like simply like how to be successful at life. (laughs) Right. How to, yeah. Like how to be successful at life and pulling in with athletics and your experience as an Olympian. And so I think, you know, just like with you as a business coach, like everyone can learn so much from you. Yeah. And lastly, I mean, me and another a friend of mine who's also an Olympian, we just launched a course um, for entrepreneurs. And we actually got this really cool crowd of athletes signed up for it as well. And they're loving it. And so we're launching it again in September. Um, and I would say that if you have questions or you're curious about what the course is about or if it's a fit for you, We'll be talking lots about it. I mean, yes. me and my, my partner, but reach out and ask me, hey, what's this course? How can I sign up? Or where's the information? Because it's, it's really meant to help you achieve your goals, create a little bit more health and happiness and avoid burnout, right? It's to get you from mm-hmm. point A to point B, that success, that goal as your best. Mm-hmm. And so um, it's a really cool course that I think could be applicable for a lot of listeners here too. I, w- I was just going to say it, like, it sounds like it's totally applicable and we'd be so valuable for honestly, anyone who wants to achieve, you know, put like, maybe this is cliche, but achieve greatness in their life while like enjoying the journey and having fun along the, along the way. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And we'll make sure that we link up all those things in the show notes but Paige thank you again so much for coming on like I said I'll probably ask you to come on again um, because it was uh, such an amazing conversation so I appreciate you coming absolutely thanks for having me